morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's like uh, Paul officially started. <laughs> the was too hot, so uh, nice to see Paul, or Paulish weather anyway. Okay, today we're going to be talking about pruning, which is, and training pretty much. I mean, pruning is, is one of the things we do to train plants to act like we want them to. So plants really don't need to be pruned to perform, but to our standards that helps. Is, uh, is generally, you know, if you don't train plants, they can either be dangerous in the way uh, or not as productive where we need them to be. So today, I'll start with what, how plants grow, because that plays an important part of why we prune the way we prune. So plants, in general, uh, as they grow, they don't really stretch. So if a branch on a tree starts at two, uh, you know, say 20 inches off the ground, that's not going to change at all. Now, as on the very young growth, the last inch or so of the branch can actually stretch in response to light and sun. It'll bend toward the sunlight. If it's in too much darkness, the cells will stretch a little bit. Once you get beyond about three or four inches, it doesn't change anymore. Wherever the leaf is, it's going to stay there forever. Uh, wherever the branch is, it's going to stay right there forever. So plants don't really stretch. Um, this branch will not end up five feet off the ground. It's always going to be there if it's going to stay. So as the plant grows, we'll just show a tree. Uh, first year, have, you know, say a quarter inch thick. The second year, what happens actually is it grows a new layer on the top of the old layer. So the old layer is still there, but it's inside a new layer. It has a branch here. And then the third year, it puts on even another layer. layer can also branch out. So it's, it's like an onion, layers of an onion on top of each other. Um, if you take a cross section of a branch, and we're talking about weight plants because like a dandelion never does this, or corn plant doesn't do this, but they have different sections. So in a cross section of a trunk, the layer that actually grows, and it's often green inside, is the cambium. So that's where the cells of the tree are dividing. It's, it's this layer right here. The, they grow in two directions. So the cells go this way from here, and they grow outward too. The cells on the inside, you don't have to write this down. The cells going toward the inside, that's the xylem, but you can also call it, it's got several names, sapwood and hardwood. That's actually the wood of the tree. Um, generally, the inside is where the water and the minerals from the soil go up the trunk. And then everything going toward the outside is called the phloem, or just call it bark. And the phloem directs the flow of whatever the plant's making from the leaves back down to the roots. So all the energy for the plant is made through the leaves. So the trunk, the inside, the xylem transports the materials, the leaves need to do their thing. The water and the minerals go up to the leaves. And then the back flow from the leaves down to the roots is the stuff that the leaves made. Sugars, enzymes, things like that goes down the phloem back down to the roots. Now, what happens on plants is the phloem 
Now the heartwood has been built on itself, no problems there. The phloem is created and it, it goes outwards, so eventually this thing can't stretch anymore. So the phloem, well, on some plants in fact, it does stretch. On most plants, what happens is the phloem is pushed out by the hardwood or xylem inside. It either does one of two things. So this one hasn't done it yet, but on most trees, that phloem cracks, and you develop your cracked-looking bark. Um, on other plants, like, I didn't bring one in, but like uh, manzanita or eucalyptus, the eucalyptus, the bark just peels off. Every year, it just peels right off. It can't stretch. Uh, birch trees often do that too when they're young. The bark peels off, and you get this nice white uh, layer, younger layer showing. So that's what the bark does. So it peels off as it because it can't stretch any further. Some plants look like they're cracking in half when that happens. It's kind of interesting. So that's how it grows. Um, now, when we prune a plant. The one thing to know is that plants don't really heal. Like, if we cut our finger or any part of our body, the cells actually heal. They actually can close the wound, in a, in a, and after a few weeks, it can actually look just like it did before the wound. Plants don't do that. They grow around wounded areas. They have to seal them off. So let's say we have a piece of a branch with the, uh, the canyon layer inside, this kind of cross-section. And say you damage it like this. So what the plant does, it can't regrow this area the way it was. So what the plant does is, uh, is all plants, you know, some plants are real bad at this, they seal the area off that got wounded. So they'll come in with their store, they have a lot of uh, carbohydrates or sugar stored in their in their xylem here, their, uh, their sap of heartwood, and it automatically creates a seal. It's made out of sugar molecules, but it's a real tight seal that nothing can get through. So if they wound this, the plant will seal up around the wounded area so that diseases and bugs can't get past that area. But it can't fix that area inside the way it was. And so what the plant then does is as it continues to grow, it'll grow a new layer of tissue that kind of covers up the wounded area. Let's say, let's make another layer here where it covers up that area until it's sealed again. <coughs> or until it's uniform again. Now, it's interesting that some plants seal right where they're wounded. They seal really well. And according to the U.S. Forest Department, the plant that seals the best of all the plants they've ever checked, apple trees seal their wounds really, really well. Are really, really, they don't backtrack much. They don't um, waste a lot of wood in here sealing. They seal right where the cut is. But interestingly, they say the worst sealer known in the same family, because apples are in the rose family, are peach trees. Really bad at sealing wounds. So if they may, if you wound a peach tree, sometimes they don't seal at all. You'll get uh, a damage or a, they'll let the area rot. They don't seal the wood, so the wood rots the same size of that wound all the way to the base of the tree. It sometimes doesn't seal at all. So if you get this hollow trunk after 20 years or so on a peach tree. So they're real bad at sealing wounds. Uh, other trees that are bad at sealing wounds are, are mostly the short-lived trees. So they say birch trees. You top a birch tree, you're probably gonna kill it. Uh, maple trees aren't too good either. But uh, a number of plants don't seal their wounds well. Apple trees, you know, they say they, like peach orchards, they say, modern peach orchards, they keep them in production for about 13 years. And then after that, the wounding causes so much damage, production just drops off gradually. So they said 13th year 
is about max for max in production on a peach orchard. Apple orchards, 150 years. They can prune, 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 make them productive, and nothing seems to happen bad to the tree. They just keep on going. So they steal really well. What the figs? Well, figs live a long time. I, I haven't seen any research done on them, though. Uh, we'll talk about those in, 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 in detail a little later. Good question. So it, before 1980, all the good arborists would go and take this tar or this solution. Every time they make a cut, they paint it to hopefully keep bugs and diseases out. The U.S. Forest Department says it doesn't help. So they all stopped doing it at that time. There's a few old school arborists that still seal. They still think that, you know, the main thing on, on arborists nowadays would be to clean your tools between trees. Because the tools can actually spread the disease the moment they're pruning it. But in general, the tree seals that wound very quickly afterwards, faster than you can seal it itself. They said the seals either don't do anything at all, or they actually help the area rot because they're trapping the moisture inside. So they said the seals are totally worthless. Plants seal their wounds really, really well. Um, but the ones that do seal them really, really well. So the, now the other things to know about plants is that the type of cut you make will determine how the plant grows. So, Plants um, are controlled, their growth is controlled by hormones in the plant. So on a plant, let's get one I can reach. So on a plant, there's hormones running amok among, on this plant. The hormones that are created in here uh, control what sprouts and what doesn't. So every leaf on this plant is creating a hormone that in the trade called oxen. There's a lot of chemicals that are in that class. I mean, naphthalic acid, there's certain ones that the plants make uh, that help control. What they do is they inhibit the growth of, of the buds. So on this plant, there's a potential bud of new growth at the base of each leaf. And on the stems, after the leaves fall off, the buds are still there, ready to sprout. But they can't sprout when the oxen is stopping them. So every leaf sends oxen down its own stem and inhibits the bud at the base of the leaf. And the top of the tree, the new growth at the very tip, sends down the most oxen, and it stops all the buds from below it from sprouting too. But as the further down the stem you go, the less oxen there is, because it's further away. So there comes a point down further when the oxen is no longer present and the buds are free to start growing. Now, if you want this bud to grow, all you have to do is clip off the branch above it and suddenly there's no more oxen stopping this bud from growing and it'll just take off and go. Now, the other thing that stops plants, stops the bud, well, the other thing is the oxen is controlled by gravity, so created up here comes down the stem. If the stem is growing perfectly horizontal, the oxen is not moving anywhere. So all these buds here start sprouting on a horizontal branch. These buds start sprouting because there's nothing stopping them from them anymore. And it's interesting, when plants are pointed upwards at all, the growth continues to grow out the tip. If you land down horizontally, then most of them stop growing that direction. All these then start sprouting. And when the leaves fall off, those will sprout too. Now, a very low level of oxen, which makes it down to the roots, actually encourages root growth. So the same chemical that's inhibiting buds from sprouting is making the roots grow. It goes all the way down to the roots. And, and so the uh, the thing we used to sell called vitamin B1 is a type of oxen. It would stop growth of buds, but it encourages growth of roots. 
problem is you don't want to use too much vitamin one because a high level of vitamin one stops the roots from growing. So you have to be careful how you use that. Think of yeah, pretty much all plants work the same way as far as uh, in, in hitting. Right. Now, if you cut a branch right here and don't leave anything on top, then all there's probably about four or five buds that will open up because there's no oxen coming down on these. So the top four or five buds quickly start to grow. Sometimes one will be a lot stronger and all the rest of them just kind of shrivel up and die. But generally you'll have more than one bud opening up if you just cut the top of this branch off. Now the other way you can prune a tree, instead of just cutting it to a stub like that, is if you cut this branch off, it won't regrow. Especially if you're close to the trunk. Because the stem is, the ox is still coming down the stem. So if you cut this branch off right off the main trunk, it won't regrow. If you cut it out here, it will regrow. So if you cut it at the beginning of where it starts, that's called a thinning cut. If you cut it out here, it's creating more bushiness. You left a little stuff. How does, um, like that big heat wave we had in the beginning of the summer, how does that affect that process with the ox? Or does it really not have well, if you burned off all your top foliage, then all the buds below it are free to open up. Okay, so then, um, okay, so then at this point you could just cut off all the uh, dead stuff. Yeah, by now it's it's what two months past. Yeah, I was afraid to cut it. <laughs> yeah, so initially you don't want to do it because yeah. the, the burnt stuff is protecting the new growth. Right. But once you see a new growth charging out of there, you can start cutting off the old okay. growth. Just remember, if you cut into living tissue. Mm -hmm plant does have to use its energy storage to fix that wound. So it's better not, you know, like in the old days they always said, well, cut into living tissue. Don't leave any piece of the dead wood there. Nowadays it's totally opposite. They said, oh, don't cut into living tissue because if you cut into living tissue, you just open up a new wound and the plant retreats even further. So now they're saying clip it as close to the living stuff as you can without damaging it. So, because the plant already sealed it, but if you open up the wound, then it has to reseal again. And some plant and plants generally cannot reseal the same area twice. They retreat further down the stem if you open up the same wound twice. So you have to be careful with that too. I mean, apple trees again, they seal real well. If you cut it here and then you cut it right below that, no problem. But you do that to a peach tree, you might lose a foot of trunk if you make two cuts really close together. And we saw that when we were when I was younger, first starting business, we were trimming peach trees, and you trim off a lot of branches in a row, you kill that plant. They go, the wound is so big when you do that, cut off several branches in a row on a peach tree, you can kill it. I, I killed all my dad's um, birch trees once, I topped them all. <laughs> I thought they were being too tall for the pot, they all died. Okay, so what happens, um, so in, a, in a, say a tree with a side branch, what you see on the tree looks kind of like this. So the main stem here and then the side branch here, um, the wood inside of the main trunk is doing this. And the bark of this tree, of the main trunk, of course it's right there, and then it comes out here and goes that way. And then the wood in this side branch is going into the main tree this way. And the bark of the side branch, uh, I don't have more colors here. The 
building. Uh, the bark goes right down this ridge. So this ridge here, and it actually is on an older tree, that's a raised ridge line. That's where the bark from the main trunk and the bark from the side branch collide, and they make a little, little uh, foothill there. So when you cut off this branch, if you want to thin out this tree, you want to cut off this branch, we don't want to cut into the bark of the main tree. You can't, well, what we're supposed to do <coughs> is you're supposed to find this bark branch ridge, and then draw a line that's parallel to the trunk, and then you go outwards the same angle. And that's where this bark from the trunk is not exceeding that area. And that's where, if you're going to cut off this branch, you cut it right there. In the old days, before 1980, we would cut it as close to the trunk as we could. <coughs> the German arborist back in the 1920s uh, said that if you cut it real close, the wound heals over faster. But they didn't know that they were doing a whole bunch of damage to the trunk inside and out. Because they didn't have, the modern arborists said they didn't have chainsaws back then. So the modern arborists, they said the chainsaws were really good for them because they can go and dissect all these trees in the forest, you know, in just a minute and cut through the whole trunk and see what happened inside after they did this certain type of damage to it. So that really helped them out. They said they don't like to use chainsaws, but it certainly helped them dissect the trees so they can see what's going on. So if you cut off this branch, you have to make your lines and cut off so you don't hit any of the bark or wood of the main trunk there. Now if you're cutting off, if you want to use this branch now as a top branch and cut off the top of this tree, you go right down that bark branch ridge. Because none of the wood from this branch is further over than that ridge line. And what that does, you cut right along here, this area can't re sprout. Because the oxen coming down this, this branch is inhibiting all the buds on this trunk. So nothing re sprouts here. If you leave a stub, then this re sprouts and goes back. So this is when you take off major branches on a tree and you don't want to do it right so you don't damage the tree. Now a lot of this stuff, you know, on a bush or on a fruit tree, you don't have to be this careful. I mean, on a, you know, on a peach tree it might extend its life a little if you don't do too much damage. But on most trees, you know, most small trees, if the branch breaks off because you did it wrong, it's not a big deal. You're not going to kill anybody. But on the bigger shade trees, like, you know, this maple deer is supposed to grow 40, 50 foot. If the branch this big breaks off because something you did wrong, you might kill somebody. So, arborists have to know how to do this properly. Now, the one thing everybody's been warned by now, so you've heard this, is don't top trees. Now, if you top a birch, you probably kill it. But most trees will grow back. And the problem with that is, so you've got this tree, and you say you cut it without leaving, you know, if you cut it to a side branch, the side branch already has layers and layers of wood in it as it grew that make it really strong. Well, if you cut the top off a tree, you know, this trunk has got certainly got lots of layers inside of it that made it strong. But if you top it, and it, it wants to regrow that top has all this energy, it needs to regrow its top. So what it'll do is it'll put a new layer on that ear. It might be more than one branch. It'll grow this branch or two really fast. Like you cut off the top 20 foot of a mulberry tree, it grow that top back in one ear. The whole 20 feet grow back. But the problem is it's only connected by maybe a quarter inch of wood on the outside of this tree. It only has one layer of connection on this new branch that regrew. So these are real subject to breaking off.
because there's only one year of attachment, whereas the original truck might have had 10 years of attachment there. This has only got one thin layer on it holding it on. Now, if you keep clipping these so that they don't break off, over the years they can build up those layers again, then it will be safe again. It won't break off. But that first year after you clip something severely and it grows back so quickly, uh, in fact, I would say first two or three years, yeah, you can you can almost count on these things breaking off in the wind. So that's why we don't like to top trees, but if you do top them, you cannot let these regrowth things grow too big. You don't want to the snap. So that's the problem with, with topping. Now you can also do, the other problem with topping, of course, if the tree doesn't seal well, you can lose a lot of that trunk when you top it. Because an apple tree will seal right there. But a lot of trees, peach tree, you can, you can just end up with a hollow trunk after a few years. Now, one thing, you know, the U.S. Forest Department told us is that termites are good for trees. So termites are kind of a part of the tree's life and an integral part of the tree's health. So termites only eat dead wood. They'll eat your house, which is not good for us. <laughs> but in a tree, they don't touch living wood. They only eat the dead stuff. So if a tree gets a bad wound in it, and that wound, that wound gets infected by a fungus, that tree can lose the whole tree. But because termites clean out the, all the dead wood so the fungi can't touch it, the termites actually help trees live, I think they said, a third longer than they would without the termites. So they said in any old forest, every old tree has termites in it. And they're there for a reason, because they keep that tree cleaned out. No, no dead wood in there. They just keep, keep the live wood only. So uh, I don't know, you wouldn't quite say they're equivalent to leeches on human wounds. <laughs> that's what they're doing, is they're cleaning out the dead tissue. So, you know, termites in nature, as far as plants are concerned, are vital to our health. So you can keep all the plants alive longer. What do we do with all of our trees that fruit trees and whatever that are getting too tall? Well you you well the main thing the main thing with pruning is the smaller the branches you prune, the less damage you do, so you keep pruning from the very start. You don't ever let them get there. Once they are big, you don't have any choice. You got to top them, just what, and then they'll live a shorter life than if you hadn't topped them. But still, that helps the production, helps you pick them, and all that. So, yes. I have a pomegranate tree with the horizontal and the shoots. Do you just cut all those shoots going up off, and then tip the side, or how do you change that? Yeah. So there's a lot of trees, pomegranates, olives. And when they're young, instead of just one trunk, they make a whole bunch. They want to be a bush. Uh, the thicker the stems are, the better the fruit production. So you don't want so many. So the first 10 years of their life, it seems like on olive trees and pomegranate trees, we're cutting off a lot of these little branches that come out of the dirt. Because if you let them grow, none of these things produce much. So you thin them out, you know, you thin them out, get, like they say on, Pomegranate orchards, pomegranate orchards work with between one and say eight trunks. I don't know what all, I haven't written up about all, but pomegranates, they, they don't like the more than eight. eight. Some, uh, some uh, farms or orchards don't like more than one. So it's, it's up to you how you want to train it. But yeah, you got to get rid of all this little bushy stuff. It's not. Well, I'm talking about the, the branch itself, how you were showing how it goes horizontally, so they start coming up from you know, in the middle of the tree. Mm -hmm. So do you just trim those vertical ones off the horizontal branch or do you try shorten and train them. that? You can shorten them. Yeah. So they don't, they don't take over. So that will become a new trunk. So uh, well, let's talk a little bit about how to make the perfect form on trees first. So in general, um, perfect form on trees are usually going to be your shade trees. Because they're, they're going to get bigger. You need them to be the strongest shape they can be. Um, this is a maple that can grow 50 foot or more. And 
generally we want, on most of these big trees, we want one central leader, one main trunk. So this one's already got a problem because this has got, this branch here is so close and so vertical that it's going to try to be a second main trunk. So that one, on this particular tree, we want to get rid of sawing. On a tree, we want the branches to be no, no more vertical than 30 degrees off center. So you want to be at least 30 degree angle outwards. And we want we don't want necessarily horizontal branches. Horizontal branches tend to sprout like this and make new central leaders again. So the lowest you want to be is about 30 degrees off, well, let's say 30 degrees off horizontal this way, 30 degrees off vertical this way, somewhere, somewhere in that range. I didn't draw this very accurately. It's where you want all the side branches to be. So if this is uh, zero degrees, this is 30, uh, this is 90, this would be 60. So you want the branching to be somewhere between 30 degrees and 60 degrees from horizontal. Is that true of all trees? Most, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's what the arborists are shooting for. They want they don't want to be flat. They want them to be coming up, but not too straight. Because you go much lower, thirty degrees, you start getting these water spouts. This new trunks shooting straight up again. And those compete with the main trunk again. So we want that. And then the branch pattern they want the strongest branch pattern is called the delayed base. And what that means is, well, let's do this first. So this tree here, <coughs> is tending to be a true base shape. So a true base is when you go from one trunk to two, two trunks to four, four trunks, and everything's dividing equally in all directions. It's not quite perfect, but it's headed that way. So this one, we would probably need that way. So the base shape is pretty strong also. So again, a base is one to two to four to eight, and so on and so on and so on. So every every branch is equal in all the rest. That's a fairly strong shape also, but not many trees. Uh, can do that. It's actually more of a bush type form. So smaller trees can do that base shape. Maples do that. Red buds do that. This tree is kind of doing that. So this is called the base shape. We do peach trees like that a lot in the old days. Uh, that's, this is a true base. This is what we want is a delayed base. So we're still going from one trunk to two but the center trunk is staying straight. And then the next branch may come up straight forward, and the next branch is gonna come straight to the side, and then the next one is gonna go to the back. It's kind of a spiral going up the trunk, an arrangement of branches. So on this particular tree, <coughs> on this tree, you know, when you get this in the ground, this branch is gonna come down about a foot which is not too bad. That's right around four and a half feet from the lowest branch. I don't know, probably this branch <coughs> might be the lowest branch that you'll keep on this tree, so it'll be above your head, so you won't hit your head when you're walking by. But, uh, but if you wanted to start here, you can say, okay, there's not many branches to choose, but so this one's coming out this direction. <coughs> Maybe this branch will be the next one going that way, and then you'll have to choose something else going that way, and then something else coming this way. But kind of a spiral, you know, it's, it's hard to get a perfect tree, but a spiral arrangement of the branches up the trunk is your best. Now, when trees are young, we don't train them uh, too much when they're brand new like this because we want them to gain some size first before we start doing a lot of trimming. If you do a, you know, plants grow exponentially. If you do a lot of pruning right when you put them in the ground, it really sets them back a long ways. It's better to wait at least a year to see what the tree's doing. And then, I mean, if you see something wrong right away, like these two, then I would take one of those off right away just to 
stop with maybe two liters. Now the problem with having a double trunk, so if you have a tree that splits like that, and you've got two trunks growing, that bark is supposed to make a ridge that goes outwards. But when they're real close together, what happens is the, as the bark gets caught inside the tree, and it's almost like it's splitting the trees apart. They call that, um, well, I've got the term for that, when the bark is being folded inside the tree. That's really weak. That can be really weak. Now, they occasionally they said they'll see trees in the forest where they do see that ridge line, and even though it's a double trunk, that's really strong. If they see that folded bark coming outwards from that, from in between the two trunks. So when they, this is called included bark. That's what the term is. Now they say that, they admit that they see some really big trees in forests where they've got the double trunk and they're still fine, but they do notice that this fold line here starts moving to one side, this trunk is about to snap off. So they watch the, the line of included bark there to see where that's going. And if it stays straight up and down, it's still pretty, it's often still a pretty strong union on that tree. But you know, if you have a young tree, it's nice to avoid that at the start. Two liters. I don't think I understand the difference between the two. The one that, that one. Yeah, so this one, the bark is growing. Um, so if you see the cross section of the tree, the bark is growing out this way. And on this one, the bark is being swallowed into the area between the trunks. Um, and it's expanding in there and forcing those two apart, kind of. Um, Whereas this one, the bark is, is shooting upwards. to see that. I had a 50-foot pine tree behind my house where it was a double trunk. <clears throat> I told the Greenbelt people, you know, cut it off before it hurts somebody. And they said, well, we have 20 of those in the neighborhood that we need to do. And they did mine first. <laughs> <So> <laughs> when you tell them stuff like that, then, they, then they've been notified. <laughs> And the trimming of the lower branches. Now, coming off the main bark, going back to your original application, is that uh, so anything coming out of the main bark, once you cut it off, it doesn't grow back again, right? So, in other words, yeah, yeah. if you cut it properly, yeah, then it won't grow back. Okay, so now we don't know how tall the tree is going to grow, actually. Uh, so, I want to make sure that you know my height is, you know, I got a great hurdle. And I want to make sure we can walk under it from mow the grass and that type of thing. Uh, so you let it grow until you kind of figure out where height one do it, and you go and you clip the top, like you say, top it, but you won't grow anymore, and you keep it fanned out on the top. At that point, then be safe to ascertain that we can chop off whatever, how many branches we want on the lower side of the table, because it, it's not at the top. So safe for you. Yeah, yeah, tree. Well, my house in general on my bigger trees, I usually let them go at least three years. Now I'll, I'll make sure they don't make any big mistakes. So if you have a branch here near the bottom that's really taken off and getting too strong, I'll keep clipping it short so it doesn't become a main main branch on the tree. Oh, okay. But I'll let pretty much let the tree do its thing for about three years and then look at it good and then start trimming. Because by three years, most trees are uh, ten by ten; they're big enough to trim up already. Um, and just so you know, too, that each branch on this tree is competing for room on the trunk. So, and the bark of the tree is can kill off all the little branches on the trunk by just swallowing them up. So, as the tree grows new layers, like this little branch here is so tiny, 
that its circulation is getting cut off by the main trunk, and this will probably just fall off in a couple years because it got out competed by the by the bark of this tree. The bark of this tree is all the leaves and branches above it, all their uh, uh, circulatory system going down the roots is what makes up the uh, the wood of the tree. So all that stuff is is cutting off the circulation of the civil branch here. If the branch is bigger, it can keep up and make its own circulatory system that doesn't get cut off. But um, So all the little branches that are too much shade at the bottom, eventually, like this branch, will probably fall off within five years if the top grows like it should. And these trees can grow like six or eight foot a year. So like what? I'm sorry. What kind of branch? So at the bottom side grows out, to keep that same fullness, basically, you want to, when you trim the end, not trim the end, but uh, cut the end, uh, or cut the end, you want to keep, you want to start off on the bottom, you want to start further away from the main bark, and as you go up to the top to keep somewhat in trim, you kind of come in closer and closer so that you can get a nice round ball. Paper. Oh, you mean trim the branches? Further out, if you're doing trimming here and then closer to near the top. Yeah. Yeah, you want, well, on most trees, yeah, you want to have the sun hitting everything as evenly as you can, exactly. which means you'll have to have more of a dome shaped tree to do that. Right. If the top is real wide and the bottom is real short, then those leaves won't get enough light, they'll just die. Okay. So, yeah, that, that form uh, is, is normal. For a fruit tree, why trimming has something to do with production of the fruit. And we'll get we'll get fruit trees in a moment. So on these, let's see here. One more thing I was going to say. Um, well, might come back. <laughs> <laughs> So Gary, those baby branches that are eventually going to fall off, do you help them and clip them off? You could do that too. You could do that, yes. I have a problem. I'm a gardener with no dirt. I basically have a concrete deck in the back, so everything's in pots and close to the house. Things like a tree will tend to grow toward the sun. Right. Is it bad to turn them? Will that confuse them or be bad for them or just let them grow lopsided? Well, I had a friend who was really into container gardening and he says all his container plants, he would turn them a quarter turn every day. Turn all his pots a quarter turn every <laughs> <laughs> That would be the perfect solution, but you know, you can just force them back. Do you think it's bad then to turn them if, if you do it? Maybe not a quarter turn every day. Well, but okay. So he thing. was living on a coast. So the one note about containers is that the side of a pot can get really hot. So they, so they do note in, like if you're inland nursery, you don't turn your plants because the south side, you can lose one third of your root system just from the heat hitting this pot. And if you lose that one third and you turn the plant, you lose another third, you keep turning the all your roots. <laughs> So, uh, you know, like out in the desert, they mark the north side of their pots. They don't, they have to keep them faced in the same way or else they lose their roots. Either that or double pot your plants, put another layer of pot on the outside so it insulates them. Or paint them white so they reflect the light. But uh, that's one note about you know, pots and turning them is the heat on the roots. That's certainly a problem in the nursery industry. They use black plastic though because if you grow plants in white pots, <laughs> eight months here they don't grow too cold in there so uh, they use black because in the winter they'll actually grow but in the summertime it is a penalty okay so if you paint them white you can turn it once a year right winter um, <laughs> <laughs> okay well, while we're still in our middle we'll mention a few more notes so on plants like 
azaleas. What they do is they form flower buds for next year. By midsummer, the buds are already at the tips of each branch. So if you go through and cut this thing about six inches into the foliage right now, you won't have any blooms next year. So you do have to watch certain plants, camellias and azaleas, set their flower buds, you know, eight, nine months before they bloom, way before they bloom. Whereas things like roses bloom on totally new growth. There are some old roses that don't, but most of the modern roses bloom on new growth. So you can cut this thing as much as you want, and the new growth just comes out and blooms. Now, there have been a lot of, a lot of uh, things written about rose pruning, and most of it uh, apparently doesn't. It has, is of no importance. Because <laughs> in the old days, you know, they always told us, well, you cut them to the, you know, after the flower is finished on the stem, you cut them down to the first five leaflet leaf. That's what we did for 30 years. And then they did a study in England uh, by the 90s, you know, um, finding good rosarians and people by the time to prune roses was getting, it was getting difficult to find them. So they're starting to prune roses with machines, just to chop them off. Uh, so they did a study, a five-year study in England where they had 50 roses of the same type on two, in two plots. One side, the finest rosaries in England pruned them the way they had been taught. The other side, a machine came by every two weeks and just chopped off the tops. Or, I think it was once a month and just severed all the tops off the same height. And they wanted to count how many quality flowers each side had. But after five years of this, they had no difference. And they couldn't believe it. So they went another five years with machines on one side, rosary on the other side, and they never found any difference between the two. So now they have pamphlets written about how to prune roses with chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the time that people have nowadays. So at some of the big rose gardens, uh, like at UC Irvine, they said, yeah, they hand out pamphlets to everybody, all the volunteers, how to work this chainsaw on this rose and get it cut down in five seconds. You know, how to do it so they can get through all the roses real fast. So apparently all this stuff we learned about how to be real careful on pruning roses to get you know, to get the max amount of quality flowers doesn't mean a whole lot at all, or at least they couldn't prove it scientifically. So is it best to prune your azaleas and your camellias right after they bloom? Right, right. Right after they bloom, no further long than the summer. So we are pruning in the spring. Say I don't want to, the, the, the trend so big, can I cut to the trunk? Yes. Take more flower from there? Yeah, now, you know, certain roses, you have to be careful, you kind of have to learn them. That certain roses don't like to make new canes. There's some roses out there that don't like to make new branches from the ground, and some make lots of them. So, and sometimes it's the individual rose itself doesn't want to make any new canes, and if you cut it off, you kill it. So, you have to kind of know your plant what it's doing. Because I had a honor rose, and I had a princess named Monaco, just wouldn't refuse to make a new cane. Whereas my Olympiad made 20 new canes every year, no problem, just keep cutting it down and just keeps making new ones, but some of my roses refused to make new canes, so we couldn't do anything with them. Question on the how far down can you cut? Well, again, uh, where it's still green, no problem, so you can cut them all the way down. Uh, if, you, if you end up with the old trunk with gray bark on it, sometimes you have to be careful, it won't sprout from that. My roses came out pretty early this year, so I'm wondering now, now there's another set coming out. Uh, so how do you, something that's already blooming already and you don't want to wait for it, how far can you go on the second, not the trunk, but the secondary? Uh, well, I used to prune my roses like winter twice a year, just to keep them looking fresh. <laughs> you know, we have a, pretty much a 12 month growing season. Up here in Minnesota, we only prune it in the spring. <laughs> you don't touch it at all. I mean, you just pick off the old flowers. You don't do anything because you only have four months of growth. But here, we got 12 months, no killing heat, you know, except for that one 115 degree day. <laughs> no killing frost, so you do it anytime you want. For us, during winter time, when it doesn't grow, you go ahead and cut it. Above its 
where it's green, you can cut it. Yeah, you can cut it almost anywhere. I mean, in general, the general rules on roads are the hybrid teas, we like to have fewer or larger flowers, and to do that, you cut it shorter. And for floribundas and shrub roses, like Venus roses, you want more flowers um, so you lean taller, which is kind of sounds contradictory, but that's what we do. So, uh, but you don't have some, some green on it, though. In general, yes. You got to leave something green on that rose. If you cut it down to all gray stems, it may not breathe sprouts. <laughs> I mean, there, there are techniques where they say you take that, you take a um, wire brush and scrub the bark off it and sometimes it sprouts from the old wood. So, but I'm not that into details on roses. Okay, let's switch to... Uh, just real quick, the production of cane is just to spread it? I mean, if, if the cane is growing in a place where you want it, it's production. I always thought Well, it depends on the rose. I mean, you have to learn your roses. Like on English roses, they don't want you to touch them because the older the wood gets and the more woody it looks, the more petals the flower has and the more it looks like an English rose. Now, what happens on hybrid teas, the very new growth makes the flowers that look like the photos. If you train your hybrid trees like the English roses, if you leave that old wood, they start looking like English roses. They get too many petals. Uh, you know, it gets kind of weird looking. I mean, we know that because uh, Huntington Gardens, the, the last rose there in there, I forgot got his name, started pruning all the roses like English roses. Just left them this big. And I looked at them in the spring, go, these don't look like the pictures at all. Their double lights did not look like double light. They look like some kind of English rose. So the older the stems, the more petals they get, and the more, less they look like the modern roses. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of that, too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. He liked to leave tall because it was less work. And plus, uh, uh, he said he got twice as many flowers. But, but when I looked at them, they did not look like that rose at all. They looked like something out of England, you know, some English-style old garden rose when he did that to them. So, you know, it, it, it's a lot of, you know, like florists. They like to trim after each flower, each bloom. They trim them as low as they can. The last five leaf leaf on that stem because then they get the longer stem, the bigger flowers. So it, it just depends what you want out of that rose. So there's you know, really no wrong way or right way of doing this. You can, there's a lot of different styles, but it will affect it in subtle, subtle ways. Okay. Um, oh, one last thing I was going to mention. This way, I forgot. Okay, so when you're when you're spacing your branches out on your tree, you've got to know how big the branches can get. So, like if you have a um, live oak from the deep south, you know those side branches get this big around. So you make sure when you space your branches on the tree, you don't get them closer together than that, because they need the room to develop. If there's two branches right next to each other and both get this big, one of them's going to have to break off. I mean, the worst thing you'll see on on shade trees, and you know they're they're getting better nowadays. But in my neighborhood, when we moved in in the 90s, a lot of the shade trees were cut so that all the branches started at five feet, all crowded like that. And by the time they were 20 years older, they were breaking off right there because there was no room for all that. That's what the original tree trimmer had done to them because he wanted all the branches to start right at five foot height. And it looked great for the first 10 years, but after that, there is just no room. That's how we like to space them up the trunk better. Like you say with uh, walnut trees and or walnut orchards, by the third or fourth or fifth year, they make sure these branches have 16 or 18 inches of space between each branch because those branches on that tree are going to get that big. Okay, on fruit trees, the main thing that they determine is that the ideal shape for production purposes of any fruit tree is a dome. It's got to 
got the most surface area. So the sun can get all parts of this tree and you get it all productive. I mean, when orchards get old, sometimes the tops all grow together and you just have this one, you know, if you let your trees grow together like this, the only place they'll produce is off the top. So you have to make sure they stay in this dome. And the other thing they discovered is that light penetration through the foliage on most fruit trees is only about 30 inches. So in other words, in the modern orchard, the ideal is 60 inches across is about as wide as they want those trees to get, maybe 60 to 80 inches wide, as, as wide as they want this tree to get. Because if you get wider net, the inside is non-productive. You've got wasted land in your orchard. So a couple generations ago, when they trained peach trees, they would spend five years making and do that perfect base, where it goes from one to four to eight. They wanted 16 vertical stems on that peach tree. It took them five years to do that. And then they only had, you know, in those days that tree grow reached 25 years of age. But now that they know that their, their neck, their, it's statistically better to remove them at 13 years, they can't waste that much time forming that anymore. So most peach orchards now are either two or maybe four main trunks. And in Canada, because the growing season's so short, there is no one trunk. And I would say for a homeowner here, that's what I would shoot for. Just one vertical trunk and everything else horizontal for production purposes. And this is the way that all apple trees are done anyway. All apple trees are done with now with a single straight trunk and everything else coming off fairly horizontal. So anything one vertical, no production. The sun doesn't hit too many leaves on a vertical branch. But the horizontal branches get hit by the sun very nicely and they do the production. Yes. Is that the deep paint with citrus? Yeah, but Citrus are really different. Citrus and a lot of the evergreen fruit trees, all they do is hedge them. They don't, they don't bother with the branch structure. They just hedge them to this dome shape. So in a citrus orchard, you'll see trucks going through the orchard. Uh, and they've got saws that bevel the sides and the top. Just going down the roads, so they just hedge them that way. So. Uh, Apparently, they don't. apparently, this is how uh, Mission Viejo, the owners of Mission Viejo, <laughs> got their money. Is that we know one of the uh, the nieces of the guy who invented the machines that go through the orchards and trim them. He made a lot of money by Mission Viejo Ranch and spawned that place. <laughs> so, not much pruning on the citrus trees. Then? Right. You just prune them. You just hedge them to the sides you want them to be. Uh, now on evergreen fruit trees like citrus, as long as there's still leaves after you prune it, that branch, the new growth will be productive. If you cut it down to an area where there's no leaves left deeper in the tree, then you'll miss production for one, one year or one season if it's alone or alive. But, so you have to make sure you, you don't cut it too deeply at one time so you're always constantly lightly pruning the citrus trees. You do it throughout the season? You say you're always uh, summer mostly. Summer, okay. Yeah. Yeah, whenever I drove through the orchards in the Central Valley, summertime, I'd see those trucks going through there with the, with the, with the saws on them. So. I think they do a lot in winter, too. Spring, they kind of leave them alone. So, okay, uh, I didn't mention this. So, the only time you don't want to prune plants basically is right when they've got their new growth in the middle of their spring growth. And that can happen, you know, for certain plants at different times. So like on citrus trees, they start putting on their new growth around January. All that new growth starts up, you don't want to touch them because when they're putting on the new growth, they've used all their energy reserves to do that. So they're at an energy low at that point. Uh, most of the apple trees wake up around May. 
So from May through July, you may not want to trim them that much. Uh, this maple tree wakes up every year, April or May. So you can prune them. You know, they're at full strength in summer. By summertime, all the energy they, need, they use to make the leaves is now back in the stems. Summer, fall, winter is fine for pruning. They used to think winter was the only time to prune because that's the time when the trees don't bleed. No sap flow. But now they know that the sap flow is what's protecting the trees from bugs getting in. So when the tree's dormant, they're more open to bug attack. You prune them at that time. Of course, the, you know, if we have a decent winter, the winters stop the bugs too. If it's 40 degrees at night, bug activity is very low. Whereas we've had some really hot winters lately, which hasn't helped. <clears throat> Our Mexican lime tree already has the little guys' uh, new growth, I mean, new fruit. So it's too late then to trim that tree? No, still pruning it. I mean, if you want to maintain size, you sacrifice some fruit. Okay. I mean, they, uh, if they're pruning in the summer, they're always cutting off fruit too. It's just, you can't help it. Okay. You got to do it. Otherwise, the tree just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, most citrus have overlapping crops. There's always some fruit going on, so you, there's no time you can prune it when you won't be cutting off fruit. Okay. Are you going to talk about the fig trees? Yes. I'm good. That's all I mean. So the most extensive pruning we do on fruit trees, interestingly, is on peaches and nectarines, even though that shortens their life. It really is the most pruned fruit tree we have because they do know, like you know, most orders, you want to, you want those peaches, big peaches. And what they found out, so they've done a lot of research on peach trees, and they found out that what branches grow between one and two foot long this year are going to make the big and fairly horizontal form, not necessarily perfectly horizontal, but fairly horizontal. Uh, form are going to be the branches that make the big peaches next year. So this branch here, you can say, well, that's about 20 inches. That's perfect. That's a branch to keep. It's fairly horizontal. Anything that's shorter than a foot, they just get rid of it. It's too short. It's not going to make uh, good enough, good sized fruit on it. It'll make small fruit. So if you don't care if the fruit's big or not, you can cut, you can leave it. Uh, and what they don't keep, they don't cut it totally off. They cut it short. And that's, that's important. So, so on this sample here, uh, on each side of the tree, they'll want, and they all, they'll, they'll kind of visually divide the tree up into sectors. And say on one side, they want the branches to be about a foot apart. So they kind of choose the nicest branches on that side. And every, every other branch that they don't want to keep, They'll cut it to about two inches or so. And on this side, you do the same thing. Uh, space them out. Um, cut the ones that they don't keep out to about two inches. And leave those, though these branches they keep will then fruit this coming year. But they grow even longer. But now they don't want them anymore because they've grown further out than they want them to. So what? So what? These branches they cut short will then grow into those areas, and they'll keep these and cut off those short. They'll try to maintain the same size tree by trading their branches that way. Branches that fruit are growing bigger. You can still get good fruit off of these, but now you've got a tree that's another foot or two wider, which you may not want anymore. So in your own yard, you know, if you want to have a productive fruit tree, you either have to sacrifice some branches so they'll regrow on the same size, or you've got to let your fruit tree grow bigger every year to get that one to two foot of new growth. It's either going to get wider on your ear, or you're going to have to thin it out so that it can regrow into that same area you want to keep it in. So that's how they're training them. Uh, about a foot space in between branches on each side. You can say this tree has six sides, you can say it has eight sides, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and 
try to maintain a lot of nice horizontal branches and uh, and stuffs in between. And then the next year you cut, you take another set of branches and trade them. With that so you have the same, fairly same tree every year, same size. And they usually don't want them have to climb ladders, so six or eight foot is about the height limit for most of these orchards. Now. You can do it. Uh, most other stone fruits are not as picky because they don't, you know, most, the, the peaches, nectarines, commercially, you've got to have that big fruit. Plums, apricots, it's, you know, it's all small. So, like they say, for plums and apricots, they don't do much pruning, they just thin. And for plums and apricots, the structure is going to be, they don't want vertical or two horizontal branches, they want to want in between. We're kind of a vase-shaped tree like this, and they'll just thin out branches to maintain space for new ones to come in in that same area. But they're not as picky about that because, again, plums and, and apricots will not be as big as peaches to sell. Your rule on that uh, <coughs> horizontal thing, is that, does that work for Puyu as well? Good. Sure. Should. Okay. For Simmons. With that apricot, how you were just saying, you cut it at the two inch length so that the next year growth will come out of that. Well, actually, on apricots and plums, both, what they do that's different than peaches is they make a lot of short stubs that fruit. Inside the tree on branches, so you just thin out the outside of it. Um, now it's, in, it's interesting, well, it's not interesting, but it's, it's what happens in our area is when we don't have enough winter for these stone fruit trees. Stone fruit trees and pear trees actually need a winter. If, like in this past winter, it was it was so warm, the bottom of the trees produce better because the air is colder near the ground. And the tops are kind of bare. If we have a colder winter, the tops make the most fruit because they get the most sun exposure, and the bottom is kind of shaded by that. But on the warmer winters we've had, we notice that a lot of the plum trees is the bottom branch that produce that fruit because they got the cold. So, you know, not only you know keep them narrower, but keep them shorter. The shorter you keep these trees, the more cold they get too. You know, I would say, you know, if you have a branch a foot off the ground, keep it. That branch will really produce well if you get enough sun to that branch. And for the apricot tree, what is that about the same width, five to six feet? That's the ideal width. Now, it's it's sometimes harder to maintain the trees at that size. Some some trees grow too fast, but still, that's what their goal is now. This is a smaller tree. The more small domes you can fit on the orchard, the more fruit you're going to get per square foot. But, you know, you've got to admit, some trees are hard to keep small. Even avocados are hard to keep small. And I used to think, you know, there's no way you should keep an avocado tree less than 10 by 10 because they're, they're light producers, uh, I thought. But now we think, you know, I, I had a friend uh, has an avocado on a 24-inch box. And I was, I was, I was going to his house looking at him going, well, he's probably got five fruit on there. He had over 50 fruit on this box tree. It was only this big. I'm going, okay, avocados can produce really heavy in a small area. So you don't have to let them get big either. I mean, you know, again, you know, if you have a peach tree that's about five feet wide, that's close to 100 feet on that size tree. You don't need it any bigger than that. If you grow a tree like they used to, 20 foot across, that's like 500 pieces of fruit, and it, and it ripens in two weeks. What do you do <laughs> with it? <laughs> so it's better to have a whole bunch of small, you know, instead of having one tree that's 20 foot across, you can put like nine or 10 trees within that same area, all different types of fruit trees that ripen at different times, and then you can make use of that, your farm better that way, rather than having one big giant. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I had, 
15 foot wide palm trees. It's like crazy. <laughs> what do you do? You can't do anything with that fruit. You know. Harry, what did you say the ideal length was for a branch on a peach tree? Two foot. Two feet. Well, one to two foot. University, I think uh, Pennsylvania did that research. Okay, fig trees. Now, figs, now, a lot of the, uh, other than peaches, a lot of the fruit trees, we do a lot of trimming in summer to get them shorter, mainly because, like, on an apple, and even on a peach, the fruit forms on last year's wood, the new growth doesn't have any fruit on it. So all the new growth that comes out of this apple won't have any fruit. The, the, the fruit is forming on, like next year, the fruit will form right here, not on the new growth coming out. So all summer long, if, you, if your tree has gotten to 10 feet and you want to keep it down at around 8, clip it off. You don't need to have that extra growth of <coughs> shading your fruiting branches too much. So this clip all summer long, you're clipping off this new growth on this tree because there's no fruit on it. And it's shading out the bottom of the tree, which is not good too. So Dave Wilson and their uh, Dave Wilson Nursery, which did a lot of research on pruning fruit trees, they are the largest wholesale grower of fruit trees in the U.S. currently. Um, they said, yeah, summer pruning you control height. Winter pruning you thin out your branches so you get production in that same zone. But summer pruning you just prune all summer long and get the height down, keep the new growth covering up the old parts of the tree. Now with figs, it is different because every leaf that they make from summer on has a fruit attached to it. So they'll make fruit all the way into Christmas time or even in January. In fact, during some of the warm winters you've had, 2014, 2015 in particular, a lot of our fig trees never went to sleep. They just produced year round. So they don't need that winter at all. They just, they'll just, you know, I mean, we learned from those warm winters that most of the deciduous fruit trees don't need a winter. Figs don't need a winter. Persimmons don't need a winter. Juju bees don't need a winter. The less winter they had, the more they produced. Whereas stone fruits uh, and pears, without the winter, no production. So, but most other of the deciduous <coughs> trees that some folks will tell you need only 200 hours because they don't know any lower than that. Well, we've seen lower than that, and they don't need it either. Mulberry, same way. Anyway, fig trees, this thing's gonna produce <coughs> more, so you don't want to cut this off. You don't want it to cut the tip, because you're gonna lose your production on that. So what we do with figs is in January, when they're least productive normally, but they might have a few leaves left at the tips, we cut them down. Now, figs grow off of the last year's wood. So like in January, this tree this year started this branch from right here, started this branch from right here and went straight up. So this may grow another two feet by the end of the year with pigs all the way to the top. So next year you have to save a little bit of this branch. I mean you save the whole branch is fine. And everything that grows off of this year's branch will have fruit on it. If you cut it down to the older wood from last year, which will then be two years old, the branches come on off here may not fruit at all. Sometimes they do, but it's not a lot. So you have to, you want to keep at least an inch of this current wood. Usually orchards do a couple inches. So if you see an old big orchard in the winter time, it often will be it often will look like a big stump in the ground. Little shoots sticking off the top where they cut it down to about two inches of that year's growth. And then these stubs will put out one or two branches on each one with figs on them. And they'll make some new branches too. And that winter, next winter, they'll cut them down to within a couple inches of where they started. And when you do that, you know, you maintain this real short stump. But this stub, you didn't make any big cuts in it. They're all this little tiny one-year cuts, one-year branches you're cutting. So you're doing the minimal amount of damage even though you're keeping this monster plant real short. 
that's methods kind of known as pollarding a tree. You cut it down, you know, 90, 95 percent of that growth that made that year, cutting it off, and you're cutting it back down to a short stump. They do that a lot with mulberry trees, these big mulberries in the school mm -hmm. They're out 30 foot, they're cut off, kind of right back down to a, a stump, and let them do the same thing every year. It's almost like it's a waste of time. It just grows the same size every year. Anyway, for this, for figs, uh, you can do the same on mulberry trees. Mulberries and figs are close related. You leave a little bit of that current year growth, you'll get branches coming off with flowers and fruit on them. Uh, just one note on mulberries. Uh, what we found out by accident is on mulberries, uh, you can make them make more than one crop a year. So a mulberry, it'll start off and make the fruit on there. And we found out that, you know, they'll grow maybe, some old will grow like 15 foot long and then just stop. We found at our house, they'll make a crop and the crop ripens, say, late spring or summer. You strip all the branch leaves off that one branch, it wants to relief. But the only way it can relief is to bloom again. So that one branch of that mulberry blooms again and takes more leaves. And we've gotten a single branch or mulberry tree to crop at least three times in one year. By just stripping all the, you know, if you leave one leaf left on the branch, that oxen from that growth, that leaf prevents any new sprouting on that branch. But if you strip off every single leaf on that one branch, it just all the buds pop open. You get new branches and more flower buds coming out of it. It doesn't seem to work on really young mulberries; they just go dormant. But on the older ones, they want to put on those new leaves right now. Mulberries, you don't need a winter. So, what we know on mulberries now, if the weather's warm and they got no leaves, they grow. So, in the winter, the cold puts them to sleep and knocks all the leaves off. But the first sign of warm weather or the warmth, the warmth they need, some mulberries need to be warmer than others, like a white mulberry. If it's 50 degrees out and it's got no leaves on, it grows. But a black mulberry seems to need about 70 or 80 degrees before it starts growing. But anytime the weather's warm enough, you knock the leaves off, they regrow, and they'll make another crop. Oh, yeah. I have a question with a fig tree, one more. Okay. I have an existing uh, fig tree, and it's like uh, 20 feet tall, and then the association says, well, you cannot have anything over 20 feet. Now, the tree is full of fruits. Now, what happens if I have to if I cut the top down to 20 feet? That means whatever I have up there, is, of course, I'm going to lose it. But what happens with the rest of the fruit that I have below 20 feet? They don't be high. That's it. So I can go and trim it. Yeah. No damage to the tree. Right. And, 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 and what you might want to do is just sacrifice one year and cut it all the way down to three or four feet. Yeah, this is what I did last year. Okay. But now I have it went up 20 feet. Okay. Wow. wow. In one yeah, so this, yeah, this cut off the numbers is about 20. Yeah. And still, the bottom branches are still fruit. Yeah, no, no big dams there. The young, you said that doesn't work on young mulberries. They go only like a couple years or three years. Or how young, how old would you start doing that? Not certain. The way we figured this out was someone bought a weeping mulberry tree, which is already, I guess, on its third year when you weep, get something with a grower. They're older than the other mulberries are. We'll get them because they got thicker trunks. Uh, they took it home, planted it, and made it crops. They didn't like the fruit, so they pulled out of the ground and brought it back to us. <laughs> we put it in the pot. All the leaves fell off, and then it rebloomed and made another crop. And that's how we first noted that that happened. But that's a third year tree. Uh, <laughs> We tried it on a second year tree in New York and this is the branch stayed dormant. So I don't know how, you know, it, play it safe, wait a few years. Because on our Pakistan mulberry in our house, which had a trunk this big, well, we can do it all year long. Just keep stripping off a brand new branch at a time and do this pre pre blown over. Do fig trees lose all their leaves in the winter or is that just like in the cold region? They used to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have winters, uh, so they used to. Now they always have the top three or four leaves are still there. Yeah, because I, I have a, I just moved into my house a couple months ago, and there's a 25-foot fig tree right in the corner. Um, you know, a bird dropped it, and right. it cracks up the wall of the fence, right. and then I live. Uh, but the line of improvement, but I'm reading on the uh, forums, like, 
Yeah. You can prune it any time. It's just that they, you know, they're if it's pruning, then you're going to mess up the, the crop. But since this, you know, volunteer figs often don't fruit for five to six years, even longer, and only half of them are usually edible. What is volunteer <laughs> when, when they come up from bird seeds, oh, okay. I mean, seeds birds drop the seed and they start up. Because I've grown quite a few volunteer figs, and a lot of them aren't worth eating. Is that uh, a reason? Because some of my figs. Most of them, they come up like with really red uh, insides, and then some of them are, are green, but both of them are ripe. Um, I do see a lot of little lofts around my tree. Is that like a, a reason why some of them are? Well, some some figs come up and they've got the male parts in there so you can't eat them, and some figs have lost the inside of them so you don't want to eat them. <laughs> I mean, one person had a volunteer thing. They said, well, these don't taste good. So I said, bring one in and I'll, I'll check it for you. Cut it open, everything inside was moving. <laughs> so you, you know, when you have a volunteer, you always cut it and watch it for a while first. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they, yeah, uh, Smyrna figs. Smyrna figs have the wasps that live in them. Or the wasps that pollinate them, sorry. And the capper figs. Lost living them, but you don't normally, don't normally eat those. <laughs> Gary, oh, yes. uh, two questions. I have a, a, a Meyer winter, and uh, in January we pruned it because it was just laden with worms. And then the guy said, How would you feel if you were carrying a trash can on your back? That's how the tree felt. So now the, the tree, you know, it's beautiful, has large green lemons, but they're not, you know, they're not right there. So can I trim it down or wait until January again? But you can trim it now. Even no, now. You can trim it anytime. Okay, anytime. And I have a violet steel cordo, and it's just giving me figs all year, and I love them. So I, I can have that yeah. in, done any time too, or just forego it. It's been about less than a year in the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, usually we wait till winter. So winter. Trim, to trim the figs. Okay. Yeah. Unless you're really in the way or something. No. Thank you. So on, on one note on apples. So apples, um, we want to form the same way, one vertical with everything else horizontal, ideally. Okay. The other thing about apples when they're young is that when they're young like this, the very last leaf on the, on the branch usually gets the most sunlight, and that's where you get your next your second year's crop. So uh, this one got cut in midsummer, which is fine. So uh, what most what all fruit trees do is spring and summer they grow, 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 don't store any energy. Uh, in fall they stop growing or at least slow down and they start storing their energy for next year's crop. So you can prune most of these trees in summer without any problems affecting next year's crop. Uh, once we get to fall, whatever leaf gets the most sunlight will dissolve the flower buds right there. So on this branch, the last leaf on this branch is most likely to make a flower bud. This is the Donegal. Actually, Donegals are really good about making a lot of flower buds, so probably the top half, top end of the stem will do that. But we know like on Fuji apples, it's the very last leaf makes a flower bud. The rest of the branch doesn't make any flower buds, it's just the very last leaf during the fall makes a flower bud. So if you prune off the tips in your winter time, your young apple tree, will not, especially if it's Fuji, will not make any apples at all the next year. So that's on young trees. As they get older, they start making a lot of short stubby branches on, on the inside of the tree. So like on this branch, here's a branch that's a half inch long, a branch a quarter inch long, a branch that's two inches long. It's already flowering, in fact. So they start making a lot of these short spur branches on the inside of the tree. And as the tree gets older, you can cut all the ends off. You're not losing any fruit or much fruit because the main crop's going to be on the spurs in the inside of the tree. So that's how apples operate. They start developing all these short branches along the, at the base of the longer branches. Now the apples at the tips often taste a little better because they get more sunlight, but they also sunburn a lot easier too, which is a problem. So most apples generally are the ones that grow in a little bit of shade so they're not burnt. How do you decide how many of those inner spurs to cut off? <laughs> well, 
that's interesting. Uh, we can leave the spurs, but just thin off the apples if you get too many apples. <coughs> so on Fuji apples, they actually did a study to see how much fruit the tree can hold. Uh, because they said, you know, if you, if you Fujis are just sweet, they don't really have that much flavor to them. They're just really sweet. So they found out if you have too many apples on your Fuji tree, they're all really, really bland. In fact, on apples in general, the more apples are on the tree, the smaller they are. So if you go to the store and you pick apples, pick the biggest ones. The biggest ones always taste the best because that means they were thin better. But they said on a Fuji tree, they counted the leaves and said, you need at least 27 leaves per apple for a good Fuji apple. And they make the apple, the Fuji apple growers do that because they said for years, the Fuji apple growers were allowing too much fruit and the quality of the fruit was getting really bad, just no taste at all. So they told the apple growers, you know, make sure you thin them out good enough. So on a Fuji apple, you may be thinning out three out of every four spurs, you may be taking them off. So it doesn't make those apples, or at least just removing the apples. So, you know, thinning it out. Same thing on grapes. Grapes grow on off one year old growth. So, you know, if you don't prune your grape at all, it'll produce better than it does if you prune it. But the plant, you know, grows like 10 times bigger every year, so it just takes over your whole yard. I remember the first grape plant I grew, uh, I let it grow on the ground, and by the end of the year, it was my half my entire backyard was this grape plant. I got a lot of grapes that second year, but then what are, what can you do after that? It just that's then it's your entire yard. So main what, reason they prune grapes is to just to keep the same size. So on grapes, it's the same thing. You need to keep uh, a little bit of this current year's growth. So this is older wood here. It's kind of bark, flaky bark, gray bark, and the newer wood is smoother bark or it's green at the tips. So you, at the end of the year, say December, January, you you can cut off all but, like on a table grape, one to two foot of this growth is all you need. Each one of the nodes on here where the leaf is attached can make a new stem with two clusters on it. So you don't need to keep much. If you just keep the last six inches of the stem, you've already got maybe 10 clusters of grapes coming off that last piece of stem. So grapes are really, really productive plants. If you keep this whole thing, you can have 30 clusters of grapes right there, they'll be smaller, smaller grapes. But that's what the raisin guys do. They don't cut. Well, the raisin people uh, do it a different way. Uh, but for uh, table grapes, you want bigger grapes. You cut it, and you can even thin out the clusters to get bigger grapes on. And shape-wise, you know, and, and on in vineyards, they train them all the same. And the reason for that is they like to pick at the same time. Now grapes aren't as bad as, say, peaches or plums because the grapes will hold ripe on the vine for several months. So you don't have to pick them at the same time. But you don't have to follow what the vineyards do. So the vineyards, uh, for the most part, have wires. And one of the new ways of training grapes is they grow this the, the permanent structure, they usually grow in two directions. And they don't grow them that wide. They, uh, one grape plant can grow 50 foot in all directions. It can be 100 foot across. But it takes a number of years to do that. So most vineyards plant between their, they plant grapevines three to eight foot apart so that they can be in full production by the second or third year. Um, so they have the permanent structure they leave like this. And then the new growth, They'll have these, in the wintertime, they'll cut their branches back short. And then the new growth will come off these. And they grow straight up and over. And have their clusters of grapes hanging there. And they'll have new growth coming off the very bottom is too. And a lot of them do this vertical stuff. Now, they used to grow them horizontal. But they found out if you grow them horizontal, they can grow 30 feet every year. They just keep going. 
if you go on vertical and come off the top wire, they'll come off about six feet and just stop. No place to attach to, they just stop growing. So that's a lot less maintenance if you grow vertical rather than horizontal. They just come up, come out, hang out there, can't find anything to attach to, they stop growing. So it's, that's, that's one of the newer styles growing them. Not all grapes work well that way, but a lot of the grapes do. So this is one way to train them, just grow them up and over. I mean, in my house, we've grown grapes on everything on our fence, on three foot wide trellises, patio roof. Uh, I grew, I had one apple tree, I didn't like the apples, I let the grape plant grow in, <laughs> off the branches of the apple tree, so there's apples and grapes hanging side by side. In nature, I'm sure that's where grapes grow, is in, in trees, so they don't need full on sun. In fact, I've grown grapes on the north side of my house and still taste good, because they'll just hang on and hang on and hang on in the shade until they get enough sugar in them to taste good. Don't your animals get them first? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, they do. One reason to grow green grapes is because the birds don't figure them out as fast. <laughs> yeah, the red grapes, they'll eat them before they're sweet, but the green grapes, uh, you can start picking before the birds know they're ripe. I mean, we put bags around our grapes too at the south. So anyway, that's grape growing. Um, just so you know, on, on raisins, what they found out is they didn't prune the branch at all, they made more raisins. So on raisins, they actually grow them on overhead trellises. And they grow in two directions. Every year, they'll cut one side back to a stub. And they'll leave the other side out as long as it is. And this side will make the grapes. And you'll just get cores and they found out they don't prune at all they just are overwhelmed with how many grapes they get. Now what most raisin orchards and vineyards do, they used to, you know, they used to cut off the clusters and dry them on the ground. They found it much easier. Just cut them right there. And the leaves suck all the water out of the grapes. They call it dried on the vine and they'll just dry up there. And they've gotten rid of all this side and then the next year it regrows no grapes for one year. And then the following year, heavy, heavy grapes again, uh, raisins. So each year they cut one side off, and then the other side, one side, the other side, and alternate sides like that. They said they've got an incredible production on raisins. So raisin production is way up in the last 20 years because they've used this stuff now. This is overhead, so the trucks drive underneath it, so the entire farm is covered in grapes on this. <clears throat> but that's, that's a specialty crop. Referring to your top drive, on the secondary growth, uh, uh, right now I'm, I'm like in two and a half years and I think it's growing like both directions, about maybe 15 feet already. So I'm going to think I'm going to have to kind of give it back. Can I, can I go back about one inch off of that main stock? Or, or do I go up, or can I trim off that secondary stock end? Well, you can leave as much as you want. Well, okay, so you have root coming off that root. Yeah. Yeah, and you can do that. It's fine. There's no rules here. But in a vineyard, they would they would just cut this entire thing off because that's already off out of yeah. their normal way they prune and just save one of the new ones coming off the main one. Here, first, the first year or the second year, I, off the main top, the one that was coming out, I wanted to keep that direction, so I basically cut about. You know, just cut it arbitrarily and it, <laughs> it just took off. Now I've got a grape on both sides. Yeah, my house, we don't fall any of these things. Any of these things that the orchard, the vineyards do, we don't fall that because what they, what, when they do their stuff, then all the grapes ripen at the same time so they can pick it all real easy that way. If you have a, brand, a plant that's all over the place and you just save the nicest wood that winter in different spots on there, well, what you'll find is that the grapes that form on the top branches ripen first, the grapes that ripen on the bottom branches ripen last, which is better for a homeowner, in fact. It's better to have them ripening at different times. So if, you, if you're, yeah, if it's not all the same level, you get ripening at different times. So you don't have to follow any of the rules that they do, but they do it for a purpose so they can, like a vineyard, they want to pick all the same day. They want to all ripen at one time, so. Thank you for serendipity for that. 
that's a perfect scenario with the kid for us, for us because we had big, huge things on them. But the top, like you, just like you said, right? In the bottom was, it took about a month or two before right. it got done. Right, it'd be a month later. Gary, I've got a, a Spalier of citrus, wine tree. Are you going to talk at all about the Spalier pruning? Well, citrus, again, it's just pretty much hedged. It's kind of hedged, you know. Now, on the spired apples, we have to do a little more work on them. So, uh, when they dispire an apple, and a lot of this will pertain to citrus, too. So, when they spire an apple, they want the branch to be horizontal, but the branch won't grow when it is horizontal. So, when, they, when they're spelling an apple tree, you want to keep the end pointed up so that it continues to get longer. And as it gets longer, you kind of lay it down horizontal. And then what happens is you get the side buds start opening up and they start growing. Well, they grow really fast. They want to become a main trunk. So you keep clipping them about six inches off, within six inches of the, of the horizontal. And as long as you keep clipping them there, then in the fall, they develop flower buds right there. You get apples all along the stem. But those are two things we do with apple branches. Now, apple branches live a long time. They can live 30 you might get 10, 20 years out of this one branch, so uh, no problem there. Now citrus, I don't know how long citrus branches live. I haven't seen all the research on that, but essentially this hedge into the form uh, that you want them. And when they start to go up vertical, then how high vertical do you keep trimming that back? You yeah, just keep clipping the top off. You don't have to cut it all the way off, just keep clipping it. I mean, the way citrus grow, so when a citrus tree is growing, a lot of times you'll have a dwarf citrus, so it'll just be a bush that's making fruit at, say, three foot height. And then when it wants to grow, it suddenly will send off this stem that goes straight up. It's got thorns, it's got rubbing, it's a juvenile, a juvenile mode of growth. They just take off and go. Um, and then what that does is, is it slows down after about four or five feet, and then it branches off, and then these branches then become fruiting branches. And then the will send up another branch, goes straight up another four or five feet, and keep on staircasing the rough that way. Some people mistake these for suckers, but they're not. They're just you know, turning back into ju juvenile growth on citrus, thorny, and uh, wet. So it looks a lot different. Now rootstock, if it comes out of the rootstock from the base or from within a few inches of ground, most of the rootstock that's used for citrus, instead of having a regular leaf, has a triple leaf, a leaf that looks like, uh, like a clover leaf. So if you see leaves like this on your tree, that's rootstock growth. Some of the old citrus were done on sour orange rootstock, so it's hard to tell which uh, rootstock and what's not, but most of the new rootstock on citrus the leaves are shaped like shamrock leaves, so if you see that leaf coming off, that's a sucker. You get to get rid of that one. But citrus staircase their way up as they grow like that. Now, with avocados, we did have a lot of trouble with the wheat. A lot of the avocados burnt the tops off. <coughs> You know, avocados like it around 100, but they don't like 110, 112. Um, now, if this was grown from a seed, generally we wouldn't have to worry about burning. So when you grow an avocado from seed, their foliage is very symmetrical, Christmas tree-like shape, so that the sun can never touch the branches. Now, when we end up when it was 114, the leaves are burning too. Normally, the leaves don't burn when it's hot. Usually, it's just the green stems that the sun can hit. When they're grafted like this, there's a lot of unprotected foliage or unprotected branches where the foliage isn't covered. So the sun hitting this above 100 degrees can burn this severely and cause damage. You see a little sunburn right there on that where the sun hit it. This probably wasn't staked up. This one just burnt right off. It was so hot. It burnt right off. So on avocado trees, uh, we generally paint them when they're young to prevent sunburning on them so you get uh, white latex paint from the, now I have a paint here like the, what they do in the orchard, it's made out of uh, silica and dried milk uh, and that's how the orchards do it, it's a little cheaper when you do that in volume than, than 
white paint is, but white latex paint, you can thin it out with water if you want. This, whatever the sun can touch that's on a leaf, paint it. And the temperature, when it's above 100, now if you buy a tree from Home Depot, it'll burn at 90. The growers who sell to them, their trees aren't very healthy. But if you get one from me, it'll be over 100 degrees. Is that even on, say, a seven-year-old tree? It can, but at that point, there's a lot of wood that won't burn anymore. It's protected in there. But if, yeah, if the tree has got a lot of old wood exposed, yeah, you still nice to paint it. Because uh, we had, I had never seen, uh, you know, the trees from this company, Brokaw, I'd never seen them burn before, 2010. So in my backyard, I had this 10 foot by 10 foot avocado tree that was only about, well, it was, it was only a couple years old, but it was already 10 by 10. And I, I didn't think it was going to burn, but that year, September 2010, it hit 112 in my backyard and just burnt the entire tree. Not severely, but it, I noticed it was burnt, so I just painted it after that. And now, you know, this last summer I painted it again. And before this heat wave, you know, we painted it again just to make sure that it wouldn't burn. You don't know, take chances anymore because we're just getting too hot. Where do you trim the, uh, you know, the avocados? You know, like you're 20 feet tall, very big. When do you trim? Like right now? Winter, usually. Which trim? Avocado. avocado. So if the avocado's too big, you trim them generally in the winter. That's when they're at full strength before they start their spring growth or their winter growth. Um, now in the old days, what they would do is allow the avocado trees to get to 20 foot, 25 foot, too tall to pick. They would just stump them. So they, you know, the trees this big, they would just take the chainsaws and come down to four feet and let them regrow. So during the drought, a lot of orchards did that. 2013, 2014, a lot of orchards just trimmed them down because you don't have to water them for half a year. So you don't, you don't recommend that. Right. I did that to mine. I had an avocado like tree that was... 20 feet, can I go to 10 feet? Can yeah, I 10 feet? you can any height. Because it's getting out of control. Right. So I cut mine down to 4 feet in 2014, the second year of the drought. <coughs> and we didn't have to water until summer because it's just stayed a stump for three months. And then it grew about 6 feet the rest of the year. And it flowered the next year. Now when did you get fruits? The next year, well, the year, uh, it missed one year. It still flowered that next that next year, it still flowered. So even though it didn't start growing until June that year, the rest of the year it grew six feet. It was a gorgeous, at that point it was 10 feet already, again, 10 foot high and 10 foot wide and full flowers. So it, it, didn't, it didn't stop for very long. But it didn't have to work for half the year. I did a seed. Well, yeah, I, I've grown an avocado some seed too. Uh, first or second year of bloom, no fruit. Third year they started fruit. They actually made fruit the third year. It was about 12 foot tall by that time. Uh, fruit was very similar to its parent. Which, you know, the avocados are zygotic, which means the babies are different than you, but they're like your kids. So they'll be similar, but they're so brief, I think it was more of a, it didn't go, I don't know if it, it didn't seem to kill the, well, it did kill a lot of stuff. But anyway, usually if it gets a real bad burn and this thing turns yellowish or brownish, the circulation site is no good anymore. So the tree grows a new trunk. So when Brokaw sells their avocado trees to orchards, they usually have a piece of cardboard that extends up the trunk this high protect the base of the tree 
So in case the orchard doesn't quite wash, they lose the top and regrows from the bottom. Above the graft, you know, they, they shade it all up to about a foot and a half, so the bottom foot and a half is protected from the sun. So I question, you know, the, the thing, this one is open, mm -hmm. so I keep here. Sometimes you don't know which one will lead the main one. Like this has got three branches coming here. Um, we don't know. This the this one may become the strongest trunk on the tree. We don't know yet. We'll have to wait a few years to see. This one may actually not be the strongest trunk. We don't know. It's too young yet. And most avocado orchards nowadays don't work with a straight trunk beyond two feet. So they want you know two foot of trunk off the ground and beyond that. They don't need a straight top anymore. They just want the branches to go out, keep that tree mound shaped and low. So most avocado works, the trees that they sell to the orchards, the stake is only this tall. So that's as tall as they want it to be straight for. They want it to branch out, be big ball of leaves, low to the ground. So with avocados, do you just, is there any reason to really prune them? Do you just let them sprawl? Yeah. Well, it depends on, on your situation. So in Japan, I was looking at a healthy, you know, in Japan, they can't grow them outdoors. They have to grow them in greenhouses. So in the greenhouse, they found out, at least for their purpose, that they would have just two branches coming off the top, and they would just start at about knee height and go sideways at about a, I think they said 25 degree angle. Just straight up this way and straight up this way in the greenhouse and have rows and rows of avocados like that. They said that was the most efficient shape in their in their in their greenhouse for those trees to grow was a single stem, but they'd have them lined up, you know, only two feet apart. So this would be all these branches going like this in the greenhouse. They said for them that was the best. But in California orchards, they're all shaped like this. <laughs> yeah. Totally different. So uh, we have about for three foot avocado, and which is painted uh, about one and a half foot. Uh, Months ago, how frequently we have to paint it again? Paint it? Yeah. Once a year usually is good. Once a year. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a reed avocado and that's got a squirrely trunk that goes all over the place. That thing's, I think, defies all logic on how I should train or prune this. Yeah. Thing. yeah. No, I Any mean. Any insight on that? No, because I went to a customer's house once and their reed avocado tree did exactly the same thing mine did. Start off in the center, and then the trunk is a spiral. And then after it hit about six feet, then it went straight up. The one in my house did a spiral. <laughs> I mean, I, a lot of these grafted trees, I don't think they want to be straight. Because they, you know, when they graft them, they use a graft the bud off the side of a branch. So it's supposed to be a side branch from somewhere and try to make it to a straight trunk. The tree is spiding it. So her, her, it's funny, her. Her tree was a spiral like this, and then it then it took off because reed is supposed to be straight and narrow. Right. And hers did that after it got to about six feet. Mine did the same thing. It, it, it just refused to go s straight up until it got to a certain height. So it was interesting what it did. My first reed I ever grew, though, back in the '80s, perfect Christmas tree form, just like reed's supposed to be. But uh, I don't know. The last ones I've grown have all been splaying all over the place. A friend of mine who had a reed in the box had yeah, there's <coughs> had no straight trunks in there at all. I think went all over the place. Does that inhibit the growth of the tree if it's in a box, one four inch box or Yeah, it didn't seem to want to go straight up at all. It just wanted to be a bush, which was a good thing for that. That's um, to cut a sucker off of an avocado, a grafted avocado, I want to cut it as close as I can flush to the main Stem? Yeah, you can just tear it off, tear it off. Okay. I, you know, I don't want to worry about damaging something in there, and I don't want to leave any inch or something because then it'll just blow out of there. Right. But. So it's nice to cut it as close as you can. Okay. So, any uh, um, ideas on how to protect your fruit? Because every time one grows on mine, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> From a critter. 
Yeah, I think it's, I hope it's a critter. <laughs> I'd hate to shoot a Your human. neighbor. <laughs> yeah. One of our customers, I guess he's, he's retired. He buys a little cloth bag that goes over each fruit on this tree. Oh, yeah. oh. So it's got a little pull string on it. Yeah. And that's how they do it in Japan. They cover all their fruit. That's why it's in Japan. It's like five dollars each. So where do you get those? I don't know where he got off the acid next time, but he has these little see-through cloth bags that have a pull string on them. Perfect. And he puts them over his figs. And yeah, Everything. my figs, my figs disappear. Everything. Well, he's retired. He's got time. <laughs> yes. Did I hear you right when you said paint trees? Yeah, they paint avocado trees. Paint mango trees, mango trunks, stems burn. Um, traditionally, they do the citrus orchards, paint them white. Uh, uh, water based paint. So, latex, light color. The cloth. Doesn't have to be white, but you know, you get white brown looks better. What kind of bag did you You just said you put a bag of your clusters of grapes? Yeah, this is Ziploc. Oh, what plastic? Now, Sunset ran an article uh, about five years ago, maybe ten years ago now, saying that on apple trees, every bag, they put Ziploc bags over each apple. And he said the apples within the bags look better and taste better than the ones that were not in the bag. Uh, <laughs> no, they turned to other. And they said they look better and taste better than the ones that were not in the bags. That was their take they use the block bags. Not good for the environment. <laughs> Did they use like the cork bags? I, yeah, I would assume. I would assume the, the bag. sandwich bag huh? would be too small. Yeah. 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 You don't have to grab that. So, you know, the way you make find new varieties and grow them seed. So one of the, you know, the first generation of new fruit that were developed at the Riverside Field Station in Irvine, uh, they planted 300 caskets, grew them all, evaluated them all, and got about a half a dozen trees. I think they got about a half a dozen trees out of that group that they considered to be equal or superior halves. I think Gwen Whitzel came out of that group. Uh, Holiday came out of that group. A number of really good avocados are just daughters of Hess uh, that came out of that group. And then a daughter of Gwen became Jim, which is their, supposed to be their perfect avocado tree. In regards to the paint, have you ever tried the uh, Ivy Organic paint? Yeah, we have it. We sell it. It costs about 10 times as much as burger paint does, but <laughs> it works. I mean, it, it has. To make it perhaps worth its worth, he's got um, <clears throat> botanical oils in it uh, to repel insects and rodents off the tree. Uh, as a paint, it, one shot last year as repellent, you've got to do it every season or even every month to keep it repelling fast. Uh, I haven't noticed it works on rats yet, but. I got the original version. The newer versions have more different, more oils in them, more essential oils, so it may work better with rats and new stuff. But it is pretty pricey. I think it's $35 to make eight ounces, which eight ounces will still cover like four or five trees. It goes a little ways. Is it an ant that's going to turn into the print? No, an ant's in a tree. So ants usually bring other pests up there with them, aphids. Bugs, white fly, scale. So you want to keep the ants out of there. Uh, oh. There, we have. Well, the better ant baits are the way to go. We have organic and non-organic ant baits. So the ants take. You know, it's, it's it's a bait. So they think it's food. They eat it, and it kills it. Uh, the best one we have is called Amber. It's not organic, but boy, does it kill ants. In our house, you plant it once, and you don't see ants for years. <laughs> for years. Just don't see ants. What was it called? Amdro. Yeah, they, when they brought it over to California, when the fire ants made it here from the East Coast, 
who can believe it? Because we had always had those rivers of ants went through our kitchen. And ever since Ambro came out, I never saw a single ant in our house ever since then. Flying only once every year or two. They do those little yellow pellets. Yeah, yellow grinders. How do you put it where the ant well, it's it's hard to avoid, but you can put it in a tray anywhere, and the ants will find it. Or put it in in a container that the dog can't get into, and the ants can still get in there. Uh, but you can just throw it over the wall into your neighbor's yard, and the ants will still find it there. <laughs> Make sure they don't have a dog. You know, yeah, that's our, right. One of our customers who usually comes to these classes, he called up Andrew and asked him how much it would take to hurt his dog. He has a Oh. Retriever, I think. And they told him it would take two pounds to, to cause trouble. Uh, two pounds is enough to cover two acres. <laughs> so essentially, you know, he can't, the dog can't eat enough to hurt itself unless he eats the whole bottle. Would you put it around all the food and the tree? I do. It's not labeled for use around you know, edibles. I mean, the rules in orchards. Because they have to use hand control there too. Is if the fruit touches the ground, you can't sell it. If it hangs in the tree, you can pick it and sell it. Once it's on the dirt, there's too many pesticides in the ground. So at that point, you can't. Uh, I wouldn't care. I would still eat it. <laughs> but commercially, they're not allowed because they have to use a lot of hand. Now they say 40% of the pesticide use in a citrus orchard is for ants. So you've got ants up there, you got problems. Does water work? The granules that you put around the tree? Watering? Oh, yeah, you want to be at least uh, two hours before you irrigate. Give the ants time to pick it up. Because it, it, what it is, it's just a poison that doesn't kill them immediately. Like, I've got some organic ant controls, but it's a poison that kills them right there. So they eat it and they die. The other one doesn't kill them for two days. So they have two days to take it back to their colony which wipes out the colony. That's, and that's why they, that one works so well. It's such a late Taylor. poison. Taylor. Taylor. Yes. Um, two questions. Um, back to um, pomegranates. Can I, you know, I have, like, I have one tree that's a three-year-old tree and then another that's probably 10 years old or 12 years old. Can I still cut off all those branches and make it more trunk-like at any point? Yeah, pomegranates are interesting. So pomegranate, there's two trees that produce on new wood. One is pomegranate, the other one is uh, jujube. So in the winter on those trees, you can cut off every single branch you want, and that new growth will still bloom. But the, on pomegranates in general, yeah, the thicker the main trunk is, the more likely it is to make fruit. But still, you can cut it severely and still get fruit. And I can just... 30, 40 branches to try to make, start making it more like a trunk now, right. even if it's 10 yeah. years old. And, yeah. Are you and then, pomegranates almost ripe? Right? Yeah, and some yeah. of them are getting eaten already. Same here. Um, <laughs> one of my neighbors does aluminum foil on their pomegranates. They oh said just cover the top half, the rats can't figure it out. On each fruit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah they'll keep the birds away too. The foil will really mess them up. The other question is, what kind of tool do you recommend for spinning banana cups? Do you have any special tools? Yeah, we generally use a trenching shovel, so a narrow-bladed shovel. And hopefully you have one with a D-handle so you can get the end of the handle or with a place where you can put your feet so you can push it in. Well, I always have my uh, big rubber mallet with me. So I can hit the end of the handle of that shovel to cut through the pups on the banana. And if you put our potting soil around there, it's real easy to pull the pups out. <laughs> Throw them in our potting soil instead of in the dirt, and it's easy to pull the pups out. So as a home remedy for rice prevention around my peach trees, I use bounce dryer sheets. You lay them on the ground around the base of the tree and they don't like the smell of that so i didn't have any trouble with rats this year birds wow. were birds were another story but no rats this year so the dryer and, that's, and that's pretty cheap yeah. change them out about every two weeks that's a good one
Now, one, one other method for killing rats is to use, if you want to kill them, that is, use uh, bubble gum. <laughs> so, double bubble bubble gum, send them out there, you know, keep your dog, keep it where your dog can't reach it, but, you know, my dog ate about 10 of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but the rats eat it, and a rat can't uh, vomit. And one piece of bubble gum to a rat is like eating this much. It sits in your stomach and doesn't digest. It kills it. Two days. We didn't, we, 10 years we heard about this, we didn't think it would work. We thought, this is silly. Why would it work? But when we tried it last year, in three days we found two dead rats and one dead mouse on the ground. We're going, God, that works. So you could die in the attic. Right. Oh, it died right. Those, th th this, these didn't die right there on the sidewalk. <laughs> you can't believe it. They didn't die in our attic. I mean, I mean, put rat poison out, they die in the attic. But with the double bubble, they died on the sidewalk. It was just strange. Out in the open. You can, they're real easy to find. They're just right there dead on the ground. <laughs> One on driveway and two on the sidewalk. Does it work for all for uh, yeah, we, we heard first it worked on gophers, and we heard it worked on rats and mice. We're trying it on squirrels, but I don't think it works on squirrels. But it didn't hurt the dogs? Well, the dogs are big enough, it doesn't, it's not enough. 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 But a little bit didn't hurt the dogs. No, yeah, I think she ate about three or four pieces. <laughs> okay. I think that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.